people trickling in. Welcome everyone, thank you for being here. I hope the conference has been going well for you so far. Um, and for the recording sake, this is the 2021 EA for Christians conference. Uh, and I want to introduce for you all, uh, Dominic Roser. So Dominic Roser is a senior lecturer at the Interdisciplinary Institute for Ethics and Human Rights of the University of Freiburg in Switzerland. Uh, as a philosopher and an economist, Dominic's work is focused on the ethics of climate change. And I've had the pleasure of getting to know Dominic over the last few years. Uh, he's not just a scholar, but also a gentleman and uh, a friend. And I'm really personally um, excited to hear what he has to share with us today. So uh, as with the other talks, we are using Slido, uh, which is a way that you can ask questions if you would like, please keep that open during the talk and you can upvote questions that you think are especially, um, especially good. And uh, at the end, we will close with um, a short Q&A. So with that, uh, I will pass it over to Dominic. Great. By the way, you've pressed recording. I just didn't see. Great. Yeah, thanks. And just to say, so there, there, is, there is this rainbow title, and it's kind of cheesy and it's unprofessional, but there is some purpose in it because I think it's quite hard topics we talk about. So I value that you take some time on your Saturday, you know, for talking about people who live in extreme poverty and they eat too little to be productive. That's what we talked about in the last session. The animal session was horrible too. And here we're talking about another emergency. So, so to some extent, it's to add some cheerfulness, but for something deeper, because it really, as a Christian, I mean, the rainbow is a fundamental symbol. It's like there was this emergency and God made a covenant with the earth. So it's just a little reminder under which heading we are having this session. And I, I said it for some, so please don't read through that sheet I put here on the title page, but there are some disclaimers there, um, just as, as information. So to start, I want you to imagine, like, let's say you fall into a coma or we have like this uh, cryo conservation in ice and you wake up in the year 2100. And then we hear, oh, humanity has actually solved climate change. And so in response, you're shocked to hear, maybe you're surprised to you say, well, what did the trick? And, and I want to ask you all, like which answer, if you heard that humanity actually managed to solve climate change, which answer would, would least surprise you? So we don't have very much time, but um, I think it's a very good thing to ask, to lean back, to reflect, which one would least surprise me? And I think it's an EA, an effective altruist way to look at things because we're kind of look, reasoning backwards from the outcome. We're saying, here's the status quo, over there is the outcome we want to achieve. Now let's reason backwards. What would be a plausible path that would actually solve um, the problem? And I think it's an important way to look at the thing because our brain is not made for a challenge like climate change. It's like intuitively, we're very bad at solving this, this, this challenge. Like climate change is the ultimate indirect challenge. Like what I do has indirect effects. It's collective, like billions of people collectively creating damage for billions of other people. It's long-term, it's global. And just our intuitive way of approaching it leads us totally astray so it distorts the solution we're finding and our intuitive way of approaching it channels a lot of energy into actions which serve the victims of the climate emergency not as well as it could. I also think in environmentalism there is quite some ideology, ideology from both sides I would say from left and right, um, that, that that's not helpful for pragmatically just looking at what works. So I really think um, environmentalism in general and climate change is an area where EA thinking is helpful. So this question really, what would, in what case would I not be surprised if we actually found a solution? So I said here, solving climate change, it's kind of a big word. So what do I mean by that? Very, very broadly, what does it mean to solve climate change? So I would say we have solved climate change if basic needs, basic rights are met and if flourishing now and flourishing in the future um, it's not um, hampered um, by climate impacts, by air pollution, and by poverty. And I think it's important to state it as a, as a triple challenge. So not just to say um, solving climate change means avoiding climate impacts. I think a lot of people underemphasize the two last aspects, air pollution and poverty. Air pollution, I don't want to make a big 
fuss here about it, but it's um, w one thing to say is that air pollution is generally neglected in public debates, which is kind of weird because like uh, climate activists are giving away an important, very helpful argument to make for climate action. Um, there are at least 5 million premature deaths per year from air pollution. So this is like massive. And at, it seems like for at least the next few decades, not just the next few years, air pollution benefits outweigh the climate benefits of climate action. So if you reduce fossil fuels, if you reduce emissions for the next decades, the major effect, beneficial effect is in, is in air pollution. That's not much talked about. So it should be more talked about. And I think the last aspect is, is underemphasized in activism and public discourse course, so poverty. So we need to solve climate change in a way that is compatible with people who live in poverty escaping from poverty. Now, I think there are, you know, so, some areas where this is not forgotten, like in, in, I think in policy discourse, in the academic discourse, everyone is aware we want to solve both climate change and the escape from poverty. But I think in a lot of activists and public discourse, um, it is underemphasized that climate uh, the fight against climate change must be compatible with poverty eradication. Now, if you asked any Western environmentalist, you know, they would 100% concede that solving climate change must be compatible with poverty, but it's not given prominence. So the, the whole fight is exclusively driven by climate impacts, and there's no careful thinking about how is the fight against climate change compatible with um, poverty eradication. So, um, which answer would least surprise us given that I'm giving this talk. I, I guess I have to give an answer, though I'd be very curious to hear your own answers. And the answer I would give is, I would be least surprised if I looked back at the end of the 21st century and, and realized that rich nations and rich individuals have financed a radical push for affordable and scalable clean technology. So that's kind of the the key element, I think that might actually do the trick. I'm not saying that it's probable. I'm not saying it's 100%. I'm not even say probability is more than 50%. But this is, would be a kind of um, path um, to solving the, the issue where I think it might work. And I, I'm very dubious that without this, it will work. So without this, I'm quite certain that won't work. With this, I think it might work. So... <clears throat> Now I have to give an argument. So why is clean technology the central piece of a, of a solution? So I said, with this, it might work. And I want to kind of make one big argument. And in order to make this argument, we have to start with two observations, which are extremely general. And they're very familiar to anyone who's vaguely been, you know, attentive to the public discourse on climate change. But I don't think it's been taken sufficiently serious. So the first observation is that, um, emissions of CO2 and other greenhouse gases, um, they must go down to zero net. And that, that quite changes the debate. So when I started working on climate change, which is more than 15 years ago, that was not the prominent like claim in, in the debate that only started slowly um, dripping into the debate. And, and now it's, it's widely acknowledged that greenhouse, net greenhouse gas emissions must, must go down to zero. And it radically changes the solutions that, that make sense. So we don't need to reduce our emissions by 20 or 50%, or if we have some low hanging fruit that would you know, reduce emissions very quickly by 20 or 50%, but then there's no potential with that solution to drive them further down to zero, then that would not be a helpful solution. We, we need solutions that have the potential to scale to 100% reductions. And the second observation is that greenhouse gases or CO2, which is the most important greenhouse gas. So what does it depend on? on uh, how much CO2 there is in the atmosphere, it depends on how many people are there on the planet. The more people, the more CO2 emitters. Then how rich are these people on average? Like the richer we are, the more CO2 emissions. And the last term, the third term is um, how much CO2 do we use to create our wealth? So if we use solar energy, or for that matter, also nuclear energy, or um, we use very little CO2 to create the energy we use, if we use fossil fuels, we use a lot of um, CO2 per unit of wealth that we have. So um, taking these two observations together, we see that, well, this is a multiplication in the second observation. So, and if, if it must equal zero, then one of these factors must be zero. That's like, you know, a basic insight. So we don't want to have zero people on the planet. Um, so I don't think we want to drive down persons to zero. 
we don't want to have zero wealth per person. So regardless of whether we think we should be, you know, greedy or poor or whatever, we don't want to have zero wealth per person. So really the, the only factor that, um, that, that only kind of leaves the third factor where there is some realistic hope of going to zero. Now that's quite crude and, and, and broad, but I think it's the core argument why, why clean tech is, is, the, is the key element of the solution. It's really the only thing that has the potential to, to bring us to zero. So, so you might ask, what do I mean by clean technology? I've been very, very general. So, um, um, that, well, I mean, there's a lot to say here, um, but I think there are some sectors that we don't talk that much about um, in the public debate, for example, cement and steel and iron, where at the moment we have very few solutions for how to get um, to zero emissions. There's also aviation, where solutions are still quite far off agriculture, clean meat, et cetera, where solutions are far off. And then there's also negative emission technology. So that's the, that's the net part of net zero. So some people um, doubt that, but many people think if there's any hope of really getting to, to net zero, then negative emission technologies will play um, quite an important part. And they're not here. So everyone talks about it. Everyone counts on them, but they're not here. So, I mean, yeah, there's some ideas, but they're not cheap. They're not scalable and they're not, yeah, widely present yet. So an obvious objection at this point would be, so why not all of the above? So why am I arguing, you know, for saying for, we really must focus on clean tech. Why not like having less people on the planet, like reduce our excessive wealth and have clean technology. And there are some reasons why that, it might seem a bit radical, but I'll quickly give some reasons. So I have about 10 more minutes, is that correct? Yeah. We have to be a bit quicker, but yeah. So why not focus on both clean tech and reducing economic growth or, you know, the radical version degrowth? Well, one version is if we try to reduce economic growth, this only makes, you know, a fairly, fairly small um, contribution to reducing emissions. Like political will is really, is really um, quite small. And even if we fought radically for degrowth, um, I mean, it, it would be a lot of effort then it could maybe reduce emissions by, you know, 2%, 10%, 20%. I don't know. The lion's share must come from clean technology. Second reason, growth is surprisingly important for um, poverty eradication. So in this space, I think there will be less skepticism. If I talk generally with activists, there's a lot of skepticism by that. But I mean, if you just, like, if you do just do some blunt calculations, um, for example, if you just redistributed global GDP, you know, you would end up at the level on a, at on an average level per person, that's surprisingly low. You know, it, you'd be below the poverty level in the US. Or if you want to read a very nice recent paper from Max Roser, I just put that in the chat on why growth is surprisingly necessary for poverty eradication. Or else there's a famous EA forum post. I think it's the most upvoted post of all times about why growth is necessary for poverty eradication. And <clears throat> yeah, the third reason is well, if we say there's absolutely no way we're going to solve the, the climate crisis without the radical push in clean technologies, making them uh, having much more clean technology, having it much cheaper, much more scalable, etc., then probably growth will be helpful on that front as well. So the upshot kind of, I'm giving, uh, uh, I'm kind of halfway through the talk, I'm giving a quick um, summary so far in, in terms of a graph, which I think is really very nice. So um, on, on the, on the horizontal axis, you have time. On the vertical axis, you have energy consumption. You could also say GDP, et cetera. And gray is kind of the CO2 emitting energy, which must go radically down in a very short time um, in the near term. And green is kind of energy consumption, which must go up because people must come out of poverty. So that's kind of an encouragement not to be lukewarm about clean technology, not to be lukewarm, be radical and say, we need a radical push in clean technology. Now, it, so you might disagree, you might not disagree, but if, um, um, if we need a radical push in clean technology, what helps to achieve this push in clean technology? What helps a lot to achieve clean technology? What doesn't help a lot, what only helps a little? So I'll quickly mention two or three things that I think help a lot. So political adv advocacy for clean tech or for clean tech policy, because how, how does innovation happen? It's really very much politically determined. Like 
yeah, fo foundational, fundamental research and development that governments are very much involved. Where it was successful, governments were often very much involved. Um, a second point is, well, you can donate for clean tech. You can donate for clean tech policy. That's that's a very helpful thing um, we can do. So I very much um, recommend donations. So and there are specific suggestions. Um, so Founders Pledge Day, if you want to donate against climate change, I think really the Founders Pledge um, recommendations are by far the best. There's also this great thing called Let's Fund for Clean Energy. And then there is this a bit... Um, yeah, there was some controversy around giving green where it started last year. And I really think the level of sophistication is yeah, far below Founders Pledge, but it could be a very promising thing in the future because it, um, yeah, it, um, the audience is a broader audience than just like quite radical effective altruists. So, yeah, and also um, promoting a mindset shift mindset shift for clean for clean tech so that we're more positive about technology not lukewarm not so negative but i must here add like kind of a qualifying thing and so i think it would be very um dangerous to just generally promote and say oh we must generally be you know open to technological progress we must celebrate it we shouldn't do that across the board that would be very dangerous because some technological progress is good some technological progress is bad and so what we actually need is so-called differential technological progress so nick bostrom coined this term which is actually a very basic thing saying you know ai might be very dangerous um a clean meat might be a fantastic thing etc so we don't just need to tell tree hawkers to become like sci-fi nerds we need to tell people you know be pragmatic and very open-minded about the right kinds of technological progress so what are some things to contrast it? So, because maybe this seems all a bit like trivial what I'm saying so far, so I want to say it's not trivial. What are some things that don't help that much with promoting this radical clean tech push? So one thing that doesn't help very much if we, is if we emphasize our individual emission reductions or if we emphasize our national emission reductions. So a lot of nations, like a lot of Western nations especially, they put so much emphasis, emphasis in public discourse on how much they reduce their you know, territorial emissions or their consumption-based emissions. And I think that's just radically wrong. So if, we, if I want to look at the victims you know, of the climate emergency, if I want to look in their eyes and justify what I've done, they don't care whether emissions, you know, whether emissions originate in Switzerland or the US or China or Indonesia or whatever. They care about whether emissions are reduced. So this means it doesn't matter that much whether emissions, you know, in which precise countries uh, um, emissions go down and so also I think if we, you know, have like a national climate policy that tries to reduce emissions, the most important aspect of that national emission reduction policy is, well, is it scalable? Are we pursuing the kind of um, emission reduction met methods that can be, make the kind, the right kinds of technologies cheap that will spread across the globe? So I think that's kind of a victim focused perspective, not focus on my acts, um, but um, treat acts and emissions the same way. So kind of, you know, if emitting, it, that looks like an act, a sin of um, commission, not funding technology, that's, that's kind of a sin of omission. And usually we have this strong asymmetry, which is very problematic, that we give much more moral emphasis to acts rather than omissions. So I think, um, yeah, that's one problem. So we shouldn't focus that much on how much exactly did I or my country um, emit. So a second point I want to make is, so there are quite some solution proposals that rely on a moral revolution of among 90% of humanity, like solutions that really only work if almost everybody um, goes, goes along. I mean, to some extent, like there has been a lot of, um... <coughs> oh, JD, I just see your uh, thing. Can we maybe like go five minutes over time because we started quite a bit late? Um, I'll try to be quick. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there has been quite some emphasis on divestment, which I think divestment, it's very hard to see the theory of change for, for how does it, you know, lead to emission reductions if the Church of England divests from fossil fuels. I don't think divestment is bad. I think it's a mostly symbolic thing that helps in terms of stigmatizing um, CO2 emissions, etc. But there has been, yeah, I think there's also a lot of psychology of blaming and scapegoating going on. So we see some people don't go along, you know, with... Um, 
solving climate change, like Republicans in the US or the Chinese or my neighbors who always fly on holidays, etc. cetera. Um, so we kind of have this uh, temptation to look for solutions that would require everyone, you know, to um, accept that they're sinning and solve the problem. But we need to look for solutions that don't require that. And clean tech is that kind of solution. So if some rich nations and individuals develop the clean tech and make it sufficiently cheap, then it spreads by itself and we don't need global cooperation. It's kind of a similar point that I want to make about global treaties. So global treaties are surprisingly hard to achieve, really. It's very hard to see. Of course, there's side benefits because they will also help to solve other problems. Um, lifestyle changes. So same thing. So with lifestyle changes, there's often it's very hard to see how they will um, how they will um, contribute to the development of the kind of clean technology that spreads across the planet. So for some, for some it's true, but not for all. I would also say if we focus on lifestyle changes, then well, then let's focus on the right ones. Um, so for example, on um, lifestyle changes that aren't counterbalanced by policy. So if policy has already committed, you know, to reducing emissions in the heating, building sector, et cetera, and then I do voluntary actions, then, well, it will just be counterbalanced by policy. And also have a broad understanding of lifestyle, for example, that includes donations, et cetera. So Founders Pledge estimates that, um, that if you donate, you know, $1,000 to their top climate charities, that uh, you can have 100 times the impact um, of you know, switching to an electric car and inspiring 10 other people to do the same thing. Yeah, I, will, I won't talk about that, but just say carbon tax, I don't think they're the big solution as well. Now, I'll use the last five minutes to say, sh sh should we embrace this approach as Christians? Um, I'm sorry that I haven't been sufficiently quick. And I want to mention three aspects. So the first aspect is, I think as Christians, we expect humans to be sinners. We're not, we're not surprised by this. We're not surprised that humans are failing in certain things. We're not surprised that not everyone like radically changes their life. And we kind of look for solutions that, you know, work with humans being sinners. And so some people say, so I think it often isn't that helpful in the climate debate if we put much emphasis, you know, on blaming the bad guys. Uh, the Republicans in the US, the Chinese, my rich neighbors, etc. And some people say, well, yes, it's very important to blame the bad guys. I think it's to some extent important. I think for the victims, it's very important for the dignity that they're allowed to do that. But some people say, yeah, I mean, this is just defeatist. You're giving up. And I'm saying, no, it's actually a realist, you know, <laughs> to, to assume that humans won't make radical changes. And yeah, and, and I think it's a very Christian thing to like kind of leave the blaming of the bad guys to, to, to leave that to God and say, okay, we'll just, we'll, we'll just try to find the solutions. You know, there are obviously people are failing massively in terms of climate change. They're, they're just, you know, flying on holidays for pure, uh, yeah, pure fun, even though that will kill people. And so blame is ab absolutely, you know, appropriate, but we can leave it to God and we can focus on the solutions. So the second point I want to make, so kind of the solution I suggested goes along with quite big economic growth. And I said yes to that. And how should Christians look at this? And I, I would have like a two, two stage answer. The first is I would say, well, let's take it as a given that material wealth is an extremely serious spiritual danger. It's like cocaine. So it's seriously dangerous. That, to me, that's quite clear in the Bible. So um, economic growth and with that material wealth for people who are already wealthy, like probably everyone here in the room, it's extremely spiritually dangerous. However, Embracing global economic growth is compatible with the rich, you know, with rich countries having higher levels of production, but consuming less and then using the difference between production and consumption for investing into clean tech. It's compatible with the rich, you know, rich countries producing a lot, but using um, their wealth for redistribution to poor countries. And it's also compatible with saying, okay, we need this economic growth to solve the climate crisis and to solve poverty. And let's pray, it's like a necessary evil. Let's pray that this necessary evil won't lead us into temptation. That's kind of how I would view, make this pro-growth stance compatible with my Christian faith. <clears throat> and the last point I want to make, which kind of leads to the uh, title of this talk is, so how could Christians be pro-tech? Is that how could we be like have this, you know, enthusiasm for technological progress, etc.? 
And I want to say three things, and that's the final thing I'm saying um, in this talk. So I think there's quite some hesitance in many Christian circles about you know, technological progress. And sometimes this is not on, on, on good foundations. For, for example, people extremely quickly bring in this idea, you know, that uh, we shouldn't play God. Um, I think there's something funny about that because actually, you know, in the creation story, God gave us the job to play God. So he created the earth and then he said, now it's up to you, you know, make something out of it. Also, kind of God is all loving. God is all powerful. He did something wonderful by creating this planet. So how could emulating him be, be so wrong? So uh, I think that this objection, we should kind of turn the tables. I think the second reason why some Christians are hesitant about technological progress and which yeah, isn't built on good foundations is this idea that, well, God created the world well, it's in a great equilibrium, etc. Now we must conserve the world. We must keep what God created. We shouldn't make any changes to, you know, exaggerate. And I think that's just deeply wrong. Yes, God created the world, but it's not good anymore. I mean, sin came into the world. Uh, the world is not in a good equilibrium. Um, that's also something that secular um, people acknowledge. There's no reason to preserve um, you know, the present state. Also, the world is much different. Like when I was born, there were half as many people. When my dad was born, there were four times less people. Obviously, we can't have the same technologies that we, we used in the past. So second point. So in the Bible, there is this, what, what's called the cultural mandate. So, you know, there's the creation, then God says now fill the earth, you know, multiply, make something out of it, etc. And this kind of signals that it's okay to to make something out of this earth. So we don't just have to conserve, we can do something with it. We can create new ideas, we can implement new ideas. And something that I don't find theologically deep, but for me, it's a very powerful metaphor, um, is so this, this, this fact that the Bible does start in a garden, but it does end in a city. And in a funny city, you know, it's, it's kind of very geometrical. It's kind of, a, there's a cube there. So it's kind of like, it starts with the tree hugger thing and it ends with the, you know, the sci-fi nerd utopia. Now, I don't want to make something theologically big out of it, but I think there is something here that's definitely not negative about technological progress. And there is something here that is a yeah, powerful metaphor. And I, the most important thing I want to say, I don't want to get lost in deep theological reflections, you know, in the right mindset. Like, you know, some people are drawn to, they're more tree hoggers. They don't like this technological progress. Some are more the sci-fi nerds, they like it. And we could, you know, have a lot of a biblical theology of technology, but I think the argument I made was instrumental. I said, we have to love our future and present neighbors. Clean tech is absolutely necessary for that. Therefore, let's be positive about clean tech. So my argument wasn't like the Bible is positive about technology. I said, it's a necessary means for solving climate change. So kind of the option of this, you know, that's ultimately for whom we're doing all this. That's why we're having this talk. So this girl and all the others, and I think, and the goat or the, the lamb, sorry. Yeah, and I think two very good ways of loving her, of showing love is political advocacy for clean tech and donations towards clean tech. And sorry for going over time. Not at all, thanks so much, Dominic. And I'm posting one more time, especially for those who join late, a link to the Slido, um, please, if you didn't at least post uh, a question, please rank order the questions so that we can um, get the best ones to the top. But Dominic, I will start with what looks like right now the most upvoted question. And that is, do you think personal changes like going zero waste or electric cars are useful or just not effective enough for the sacrifice of time and money? And just as a caveat, we do have about five more minutes uh, before we really need to head off and go to the closing remarks that Caleb will, will give. Um, well, I mean, in some ways they're obviously useful. So, you know, the direct, in, they directly reduce emissions. So I think there are some ways in which they, they could not just be less effective, um, but even negative. And one is the, the moral licensing effect, like that you feel oh, you know, I've bought organic food. Now I don't need to donate. So if that happens, and I think that happens in part, at least in part of rich countries, this moral licensing effect that people put their energy into lifestyle changes, then they felt like they did something. Um, so then it could actually be net negative. And, uh, and also I think it just takes away, takes up a lot 
a lot of attention. For me, the big question is, so look into this girl's eye. I don't say this because I have to slide up. That's generally my question that they often have. Look into this girl's eyes and ask yourself, which actions can I really justify to her? Can I justify putting a lot, a lot of energy and going zero waste? Or should I put my energy somewhere else? And then I think we can all find the answer that's right for ourselves. Because obviously going zero waste, the direct impact is very positive. Another person asks, how can a pro-growth strategy for climate change address the Christian aims of justice, meaning address the impacts on the poor and the West's historic emissions? Yeah, so I haven't emphasized it much, but I think actually North-South justice, to me, to put it crudely, North-South rich poor justice, it's, it's extremely key to climate policy and to climate, to climate change. So I think, where, where does it appear in my suggestion? So it appears in my suggestion, the fact that I think this is the key task for rich people to make this technological change possible. So, you know, I live in Switzerland and, and so there's a lot of debate about wh which technologies shall we use to, um, to, to, yeah, to get, to get to net zero. And I think the key question should be which technologies will be helpful to Indonesia and Bangladesh to get to net zero and China, et cetera. I think Switzerland should, you know, just finance a completely new university that exclusively researches green technologies that help to solve climate change. So I think, um, yeah, um, climate justice in that sense, it appears in the sense that, you know, making this technological progress possible is uh, a task for rich countries. And then there are elements that I didn't mention in the thought, like um, climate adaptation, which should be fi financed by the rich and compensation for loss and damage, which should also be financed by the rich. Okay. And one last question. What role, if any, can EA play in for-profit innovation in climate change mitigation? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so here I'm no expert. So um, maybe we can take a different question. So, or maybe someone else has a good answer on this. Um, I, I mean, it's a great question. I, I, I don't have the answer. So this is a, there's a paper by Ellen Quigley that I can post in the chat if anyone's interested from EA Finance. Sure, leave that in the chat, Alex. Um, and I'll throw one last quick question. Uh, and the question is, God asked us to be good stewards and cultivate and tend for the earth. Why should we pursue growth, which usually means more humans uh, in a worse earth? Um, so, yeah, okay. Big question, yeah. Um, so, yeah, we should absolutely st be stewards for the earth. That's the, that's the premise I, I fully accept. So I don't think we should in accept this interpretation of stewardship where stewardship means like, you know, like the bur person in the, in the Bible parable who has buried their talent in the ground just to make sure, you know, nothing happens to it. We should rather be stewards in the sense of like being active, creative people and making something. And, and I mean, also so far growth hasn't been bad for humanity. So, so far the trick has worked, but I mean, of course the problem is that there's a time lag. So, so far we had the benefits of growth, like millions and millions and millions of people came out of poverty, but there's this time lag because climate change is in store and other technological risks that we created through growth and which are only coming up in the future. So I'm not saying net growth was good so far. Um, the present effects are, are definitely good. And then my view, for, towards growth is, and sorry, it will take a minute, but I'll try to be quick. Is, so when animals are attacked, they have like three strategies. So either they flee backwards or they freeze or they flee forward. So if like, you know, a mouse, uh, like a mouse is attacked by a lion, if the danger is too big, then the mouse has to attack the lion and bite his nose or so. And kind of that's, that's my approach to economic growth. I, I think economic growth and technological progress has got us into this mess, must also get us out, out of this mess. So kind of like, let's say I got into, I drove into a desert with the car and I'm thinking, and now I'm lost. I don't know how to get out of the desert. So I shouldn't say, oh, blimey, you know, this car has got me into a mess. I better walk back, you know, because the car is the culprit. In that case, I think, well, okay, you know, it wasn't good that I got into the desert with the car, but now at, at least I also need to use the car um, to, to, to get out of it and use economic growth as a tool. I don't think the, the vision that we have is like uh, material wealth above some, some, some basic level. I think we 
we we want bliss for everyone, but we expect bliss from God. But I think um, that's a vision for the far future. In the meantime, I think economic growth is a tool that we use to solve poverty and to climate emergency. That's my perspective. Great. Thanks, Dominic. And thanks for all the great questions. Um, right now, we are having the closing talk at this link. Um, I'm going to end the call right immediately because it's on the same Zoom account. But thank you all for coming. And um, thank you, Dominic. <laughs>